today, January 19, 2021. I'm going to read to you the second part of Chapter 7, the last chapter in the book Paddington at Large by Michael Bond. This is about a theatre where Paddington is going to make the sounds behind the stage. Christmas time. Several times Father Christmas came through a secret panel in the wall, holding a lighted candle in his hand, and each time he disappeared he was followed after a short interval by Mr. Price, playing the part of a mysterious butler. If Father Christmas was acting strangely, Mr. Price's actions were even more peculiar. Sometimes he came on, waving the secret plans with a triumphant expression on his face, and at other times he looked quite sinister as he shook an empty fist at the audience to the accompaniment of a roll of thunder. <laughs> Behind the scenes, Paddington was kept very busy. Apart from the thunder, there were the coconut shells that to be banged together whenever anyone approached the castle, not to mention clanking drawbridge noises and creaking sounds each time a door was opened. In fact, there was so much to do, it took him all his time to follow the script, let alone watch the action on the stage, and he was quite surprised when he looked up suddenly in the middle of one of his thunder records and found it was the interval. Very good work, Mr. Brown, said Harold Price as he came off the stage, mopping his brow and stopped by Paddington's table. I couldn't have done it better myself. I don't think you missed a single cue. Thank you very much, said Paddington, looking very pleased with himself as he returned Mr. Price's thumbs up, thumbs up sign with a wave of his paw. Quite a lot of people had come in and gone in in the first half. Quite a lot of people had come and gone in the first half of Mr. Price's play, and altogether he wasn't sorry to sit down for a while and rest his paws. In any case, the serfs had to be put in several appearances during the second act, and he was anxious to practice his lines while he had the chance. It was some minutes after he had settled himself underneath the table, with the script and the jar of marmalade, that he noticed an unusual amount of noise going on at the back of the stage. It seemed to have something to do with Harold Price. Having mislaid his secret plans. Several times his voice rose above the others, saying he couldn't go on without them because a lot of his important lines were written in on the back. Paddington scrambled out hurriedly in order to investigate the matter, but by the time he stood up everything had gone quiet again, and order seemed to have been restored as the curtain went up for the second act. Paddington was looking forward to the second half of Mr. Price's play, and even though a lot of people were still creeping around behind the scenes with anxious expressions on their face, he soon forgot about it as Father Christmas made his entrance and approached Mrs. Miss Flint's couch in the center of the stage. From the little that could be seen of him behind his beard, Father Christmas looked most unhappy as he addressed Miss Flint. I had hoped to bring the glad tidings, he cried in ringing tones, but Allah, I'm undone, for I have lost the secret plans. You what? exclaimed Miss Flint, jumping up from her couch in alarm. Miss Flint had spent the interval in her dressing room, and she was as surprised as anyone to learn that the plans really were missing. What have you done with them? she hissed. I don't know, said Father Christmas in a loud whisper. I think I must have put them down somewhere. A uh, nice weather we've been having lately, he continued in a loud voice as he played for time. Hast thou read any good books lately? <laughs> From his position at the side of the stage, Paddington looked even more surprised than Miss Flint <laughs> at the sudden turn of events. 
Mr. Price had explained the play very carefully to him, and he felt sure no mention had been made of any character called Tidings. <laughs> then there was the question of the cloak. Father Christmas appeared to be wearing his cloak in exactly the same way that he had worn it all through the play, and yet he definitely said something about it having come undone. Paddington consulted his script several times in case he'd made a mistake, but the more he looked at it, the more confused he became. It was as he turned round to the desk in order to play one of his thunder records, just be on the, to be on the safe side, that he received yet another surprise. For there, lying in front of him, was a dog-eared pile of papers with the words Secret Plans, Property of Harold Price, written in large letters across the front. Paddington looked at the papers and then back at the stage. A nasty silence seemed to have come over the audience, and even Father Christmas and Miss Flint appeared to have run out of conversation as they stared at each other in embarrassment. Coming to a decision, Paddington picked up the secret plans and hurried on to the stage with a determined expression on his face. After raising his head several times to the audience, he waved in the direction of the Browns and Mr. Gruber and then turned toward the couch. Oh, it's Bodkins, he cried, giving Father Christmas a hard stare. I've come to do you up. You've come to do what? repeated Father Christmas nervously, as he stood clutching the candle in one hand and the end of, of the couch in the other. I'm afraid I can't see anything about glad tidings in my script, continued, continued Paddington, but I've found your secret plans. Paddington looked very pleased at himself as a burst of applause came from the audience. Scurvy knave, he explained, claimed, making the most of his big moment. Gadzooks, you left them under my coconuts. I left them where? said Father Christmas in the days, as Paddington held out the plants and he exchanged them for the candle. Under my coconuts, explained Paddington patiently. I think you must have put them there in the interval. Fancy leaving your plants under a bear's coconuts, is Miss Flint. A fine spy you are. While Miss Flint was talking, a glassy look came over Father Christmas. So much had gone wrong already that evening. It didn't seem possible. Anything else could happen, but there was definitely a very odd odor coming from somewhere. Can you smell something burning? he asked anxiously. Miss Flint paused. Good heavens, she cried, hurriedly taking the candle away from Paddington. It's your beard, it's on fire. It's all right, Mr. Christmas, I'm coming, called Paddington as he climbed up onto the couch. I think I must have held the wick too close by mistake. A gasp of surprise went up from the audience, as Paddington took hold of the beard and gave it a tuck. Well, I'm blowed, said a voice near the browns, as the whiskers came away in Paddington's paws and revealed the perspiring face of Harold Price. Fancy that! It was the butler all the time, disguised as Father Christmas. What a clever idea, said a lady in the row behind, having him unmasked by a bear. A most unusual twist, agreed her companion. My play, groaned Gerald Price, collapsing into a chair and fanning himself with a secret lens as the curtain came down. My masterpiece, ruined by a bear. Nonsense, exclaimed Miss Flint, coming to Paddington's rescue. It wasn't Mr. Brown's fault. If you hadn't lost the plans in the first place, all this would never have happened. Anyway, she concluded, the audience seemed to like it. Just listen to them. Mr. Price sat up. Now that Miss Flint mentioned it, there did seem to be a lot of applause coming from the other side of the curtain. Several people were, were shouting. Author! and someone even appeared to be making a speech. I feel, said the judge as they joined him on the stage, we must congratulate Harold Price on his pantomime. It was undoubtedly the funniest play of the week. 
The funniest, began Mr. Price, but it wasn't meant to be funny. The judge silenced him with a wave of his hand. Not only was it the funniest, but it had the most unusual ending I've seen for many a day. That surf bear, he said, as he consulted a piece of paper in his hand. His name doesn't seem to appear on the program, but he played his part magnificently. Remarkable timing, the way he said light to your beard. One false move with his paw, and the whole lot might have gone up in flames. I have no hesitation, he concluded, amid a long burst of applause from the audience, in awarding the prize for the best play of the festival to Mr. Harold Price. Harold Price looked rather confused as the applause died away, and someone called out, Speech! It's very kind of you all, he said, and I'm most grateful, but I think I ought to mention that although I wrote the play, young Mr. Brown there here had quite a large paw in the way it ended. It shouldn't be standing, I shouldn't be standing here now, if it wasn't for him, he added, as he turned to Paddington, amid another outburst of clapping, and I would like to think he'd gone, I wouldn't like to think he'd gone unrecognized. That's such a British way of saying it. How kind of Mr. Price to give Paddington some of the credit, said Mrs. Brown later that evening, as they made their way home through the snow. I wonder what he meant when he said Paddington had a paw in the ending. Knowing Paddington's paw, paws, said Mr. Bur Mrs. Bird, I shudder to think. <laughs> shudder. Mr. Gruber and the Browns looked back at Paddington in the hope of getting some kind of an explanation, but his head was buried deep in his duffel coat, and he was much too busy picking his way in and out of their footprints to hear what was being said. Paddington liked snow, but while they'd been in the theatre rather than too much, but while they'd been in the theatre, rather too much had fallen for his liking and he was looking forward to warming his paws in front of the fire at number 32 Windsor Gardens. Apart from that, the sight of a Christmas tree in someone's window had just reminded him of the date and he was anxious to get home as quickly as possible so that he could hang up his stocking. There, will, there were se still several more days to go before the holiday, but after watching Mr. Price's play that evening, Paddington didn't want to take any chances, particularly over such an important matter as Father Christmas. This is the end of the book, Paddington at Large.